the box. I think that's probably the best way to do it is you uh, otherwise would have to sign out and sign back in. So if you could just in the chat box at some place indicate your name, your full name, and your CCA, we'll make sure that you get recorded. Well, in our presentation today, we want to cover three main topics. The first will be evaluating uh, plant stands, followed by uh, weed identification control by Kirk Howitt. He's uh, in the Department of Plant Sciences, NDSU, and the final speaker will be Blake Vandervorst uh, with Ducks Unlimited. We'll talk about uh, disease and nitrogen management. I think after uh, Kirk's um, presentation, we'll certainly take uh, time for him to answer some questions. He'll have to leave. Um, if I finish in good time, I might take a few questions on my section, but uh, please uh, feel free to hold questions to the end as well. Uh, we'll take whatever time needs. We do plan to finish in general terms after an hour. So I'm Joel Ransom, Extension Agronomist for Cereal Crops. My, uh, part of my presentation, I want to talk about evaluating plant stands. And as you all know, having a good stand in the spring is key to a productive winter wheat crop. And uh, I've got a little graph there that shows the relationship of uh, percent winter survival and yield. And so ultimately, we want uh, to have a reasonable plant stand so that we can work with. The question is, how much do we really need? And what are some of the factors that are going to affect survival? And I think this is one of the reasons we want to talk about this today is because uh, we did make, we did start uh, our winter wheat crop last fall in pretty poor conditions. But the factors that are going to impact the amount of uh, winter survival are going to be the environment. Um, we have little or no control over that. Temperature at the crown is probably the most definitive of these uh, environmental factors that we're going to talk about. The second would be the state of hardening, uh, which is the time of year. We'll talk a little more detail about that. The variety okay. sown, and the size and bigger of the plant in the fall. So these would be the four main factors that are going to be uh, influencing the amount of uh, winter survival that we have. And if we look at the, the uh, general graph that would indicate to what temperatures our plants can tolerate uh, cold, you can see uh, this top graph. Uh, is uh, some data from Kansas State. You can see that we start, uh, as the plant is emerging, it is not able to tolerate cold. It's kind of like uh, spring wheat in that state. And as we go through a period of cold, it will harden off. And it gets to the point where it will be able to withstand cold temperatures down to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And it will persist in that uh, level of uh, winter hardiness. Uh, until about February, and at that point, the reserves uh, start to diminish and it becomes uh, more susceptible to cold. And we see that as we move into the much uh, where we are now, the ability to withstand cold is, is significantly reduced. And it's not uncommon to have uh, plant stands that had made it through the winter up to this point actually be lost uh, when you have and go through a cycle of freezing and thawing. Uh, and you can see that there's a pretty wide band of, of, uh, of temperatures that can be tolerated. It really depends on the type of plant, so the, the reserves in the plant, the variety of its own, and the kinds of fluctuation in temperatures. So it's pretty hard to predict precisely what kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what the plant is going to be able to, to withstand. Let me just uh, review with you some data from last year. This was a winter survival model that was put up in Canada. Just one thing too, they didn't actually get to see the mouse come through there. Okay. So if you want, that's just, okay. If you want, you can just go in there and you want something, just go click the arrow and see how the arrow shows up. All right. That's what's great. And that arrow will move around. Well, you can make okay. a new one. All right. So last year, Sorry about that little uh, intervention. It was a, hopefully a useful one. I was having all kinds of fun uh, with my pointer, and you weren't seeing it. But uh, last year, we did have uh, a winter wheat survival model. It was very descriptive in, in kind of showing how the winter wheat plant uh, tolerates cold. And, uh, and depending on the variety, you can see that uh, like falcon and, and uh, cipitor were able to tolerate just about minus 4 uh, Fahrenheit. And as you get further into the spring, uh, 
you can see that there were cases where we actually had winter kill as a result of plant being less uh, winter hardy and, and temperatures being uh, too cold for it to survive. We look briefly at where we're at here. This is some data that uh, John Nowatsky has been recording, and uh, the top the, this top graph shows the winter uh, Golden Valley. And uh, if we look at the um, uh, the uh, te soil temperatures under a short stubble, we can see that certainly the temperatures are less; they haven't captured as much snow, but in General, I would say that those temperatures, none of them are below what we would say is a critical level, level for winter, winter kill. We go to Cass County, the, the bottom graph, we can see that we have had some uh, temperatures, uh, soil temperatures. I think these are about one inch depth where our crown would likely be uh, down 10 degrees. But again, probably because of the snow cover we've had that uh, our temperatures, uh, at least in these areas, haven't been uh, excessively low, so we have to be too concerned about winter kill yet. Um, I talked about variety being important, and this is these are some data I collected in 2003 and 4 that I haven't been able to replicate. It was a perfect year for having some wind, and uh, looking at the soybean residue, you can see that our uh, varieties coming from more southern locations uh, we, we had a very high level of mortality, uh, whereas uh, with a little bit of snow cover under the seeds, uh, wheat residue, all of our varieties were able to tolerate uh, the winter. And so variety choice is really critical. And I know we've introduced a lot of southern kind of winter wheat varieties into our system. And so this might be a year um, where we see some of those failing because of the uh, uh, late planting and other factors uh, where in the last couple of years we've had really good survival because of the snow cover and other things. Uh, as I mentioned, the size of the plant going into the fall can have an impact on the winter hardiness. And here's just an example of, uh, you know, very late planted, small plants, very few reserves. It's going to have less ability to tolerate go long cold than this plant up here. And, and you can't actually plant too early and have too big a plant. Generally, we don't have that problem in North Dakota very often because by the time you get in and plant that recommended date, you don't get a plant that's much bigger than kind of that, what that first one looks like. So I think this is one of the issues we're a little concerned about. We had very late uh, emergence because we planted late. We got the rains didn't come until much later than normal, and and so um, we probably had the plants that just kind of set, set there uh, and very rarely got a start. So let's talk about what constitutes a reasonable stand. Uh, you want to go out and count several areas. Uh, uh, probably I've mentioned two foot length. Probably five foot would be more uh, realistic. And you want to do it in representative areas of the field. You may have some parts of the field where you have big gaps, and, and you want to count those differently than, say, uh, other more normal fields. You want to evaluate for vigor. And we have a kind of a general recommendation that uh, we can tolerate uh, plant stands down to as low as five plants per foot. I mean, that's probably on our lower end. Or for winter wheat, if you compare that to spring, you can see that we can tolerate about half the stand that we can with uh, winter wheat or with spring wheat. Um, here's just some data uh, showing you uh, that bottom graph would be coming from Mandan that you really start to see uh, a yield reduction when the plant stand is below probably at seven or eight, but uh, we probably are able to to maintain yield sufficient to make it profitable to keep that stand if uh, even when we're in that five plants per square foot range. Um, this is some data that I showed you previously showing you the relationship between yield and plant stand. And here, you know, we had it down as low as 20% survival. Uh, this would have been uh, kind of an objective a subjective evaluation uh, that we were getting up to 60 bushels, which would indicate that you probably want to hang on to that uh, stand. 
Um, some other data, this is put together by Steve Dvorak, looking at uh, some of the, you know, a range of, of varieties over a number of years. Uh, and you can see that, again, probably about that 30 to 40 percent uh, stand in the spring is going to be a critical level uh, where you want to keep it uh, versus where you want to think about uh, tilling it up and finding something else. I'm going to skip the slide and that slide, but basically just showing you the same relationships as you get into that 55 and above is not so problematic. Uh, but what it, this is, might be what your field will look like in the spring if you're evaluating your plant stand. And you can see that in this case, the leaves have all burned off. And, and you know, some years we keep green leaves throughout the winter, but uh, just because hot leaves have been uh, frosted off doesn't mean the plant is dead have a really nice technique for determining uh, quickly whether your plants are dead out there. You can dig them up, nice to wash the dirt off, clip back uh, the leaf tips, put them in a bag, keep it warm, and, and usually within 24 hours you can you can see uh, something emerging. If you don't need it by two days, then you can be a little bit worried. But you can see in this case a nice little green shoot starting to emerge after probably after. So in summary, I think our optimum for winter wheat would be to have a stand in that 20 to 25 uh, plants per square foot, uh, but stands between 12 and 15 per square foot are more than adequate most years. And stands as low as even five per square foot have yielded well if, yield, if conditions are conducive to tiller development. And you want to consider how uniform the stand is across the fields, uh, Certainly, you can have big patches, and it's not uncommon to have big patches where you lose stand and other parts would be normal. Um, and you may have to develop a strategy for how to fill in those patches. Not a good idea to leave patches just to weed. Uh, others have planted some spring wheat, but you can imagine the ch challenges of also harvesting two classes of wheat at the same time. And so, you know, you kind of have to have a strategy in place as to how you might handle those patches. I think the bag test is really useful for if you're a little worried about whether their, their crop made it or not. And it's as simple as going and getting a few plants, taking the dirt off, soil off the plants, cutting back the tissue, and observing any regrowth. Um, this, this fall, as I mentioned previously, we planted late. The plants got emerging late. And so these small seedlings are very difficult to evaluate. Um, they're going to take some while before they'll start to emerge and showing in green. And I think the message here would be we'll probably have to be patient and, and see uh, how things get going uh, once we have the snow melt and temperatures. Uh, we don't want to disc up a, a crop that's, that in a week later will we'll show some real uh, green and vigor. And uh, I think the question that might have coming our way is did vernalization take place in this late planted uh, material? And I think that most folks that I've talked to would say it's very unusual that we didn't get enough imbibition and, and start the germination process in the fall, and maybe even this spring, if that's the case, that we won't, that we won't have enough accumulated cold weather to do vernalization. So I, I don't think that's going to be as big a concern as whether we actually have an adequate, an adequate stand in the spring. So with that, uh, I think I'm kind of probably have time for one question. If somebody wants to ask a question, then I'll turn it over to uh, for the uh, topic on weed control and identification. I can't see any hands up there. I think Kirk, I'll turn it over. Thanks, Joel. Good morning, everybody. Just work through here. Joel and Blake had asked me to come in and talk a little bit about the weed control, especially the winter annual uh, weed complex. And I had opportunity to stick a few other things in there as well, especially uh, towards the end. Some of you may have been involved with the kosher monitoring. Uh, sample collections that uh, we did over the winter, and I've got some 
information there relative to glyphosate as well as uh, the response of the plant samples to fluoroxapir. So I think we're, you know, thinking about winter wheat and definitely the winter annual grass complex is uh, causes consternations for all kinds of people. Truth sheet being a species that we don't see in North Dakota very often, is definitely more of Montana wheat. But areas where it is an issue it definitely is occurs in enough population to where it definitely reduces yield. And as you can see, the the heads there kind of describe those as a an open football shape, and as opposed to Japanese burr, which we'll be looking at a little bit. Relatively little pubescence on the leaf tissue, membranous, short membranous ligule, and if we compare that with Japanese brome, Japanese brome does have a very short ligule. It has a very dense uh, mat of hairs along the, the sheath of the leaf, as well as uh, hairs on the leaf surface itself on the blade. Still fairly small, so it's not easy. It's not like yellow foxtail where you see those very long scraggly hairs at the base of the leaf blade, but it creates a shroud around the plant, so you can see plants kind of have a halo up to it in our wall. And as you see this in this next slide, that dense mat, very, very heavily pubescent, and the amount of pubescence is related to the temperature regime that it's been exposed to, as well as some of the environmental conditions related to moisture. So yeah, very densely pubescent, you can have fairly sparse pubescence, but they tend to be quite long relative to the jet, uh, to, relative to the downy prone surface. And then with the seed head there, you can see it's more of a compact football shape. Uh, the florets, uh, the individual seeds, do not open up at nearly as much as but downy brome is really the the one that causes us all of our problems in North Dakota. It is more difficult to control with herbicides and is able to germinate and emerge in the spring and along with Japanese brome and easily produce seed. We talked briefly previously about fertilization of winter wheat crop. Well, that can have that needs to happen with these plants as well. And even the cooler spring temperatures at, in the evenings is enough to initiate seed production for these plants. So just because it emerges late in the spring doesn't necessarily mean you're going to avoid seed production. This also has a dense sheath pairs, but they're quite a bit shorter. And I think the entire feel of the plant has a lot more of a velvety touch. Downy brome tends to be a little bit more prone to purple coloration that's brought on by the cold through the winter. And you can see downy brome in wheat, the tint of purple coloration, reddish coloration, and then also one of the seeds with the long on that will give the downy brome inflorescence a much more feathery appearance, as you see on the right, as opposed to the tight clusters of the ball shaped hummus of the Japanese brome seed florets. Downy brome, like I said before, is definitely more difficult to control than Japanese brome. And when it establishes in the fall, if you wait until the spring, it can create very difficult control situations. This control is, tends to be more metal in the fall. The plants are smaller. They haven't initiated as many tillers, and there's just not as much tissue to try to get control with the herbicide. Control options before the winter wheat is in the ground, of course, include glyphosate, which has provided very exceptional control. And we do have two products, Olymp or Prepare, that are registered before wheat. And both of those can provide some suppression. I would not necessarily expect complete 
full season control, but they will help reduce the early season competition so that we have smaller plants later on in the post emergence treatment. As far as post emergence, then <clears throat> if you have clear field wheat, beyond is definitely a good option. And I've also found Olympus Powerflex to be very good options for control of these winter annual probes. <coughs> Maverick can provide a very good level of control. However, in North Dakota with our high soilage, we definitely have issues with carryover. And so there's probably not a lot of Maverick used, except for areas where you know that you're going to be coming back to cereals in the following season. And then Sierra or Everest, Rimfire Max, do provide good suppression. And if the plants are small enough, will provide adequate control of the downy probe. And those that are strong enough, they should provide excellent control of the Japanese probe. Foxtail barley is another plant that's becoming an issue throughout the state. And in the seedling stage, it is very small, very thin leaves. Also has pubescence along the leaf sheath, but the leaf blades are narrower. And at the seedling stage is when you really need to control this because as a perennial, once it truly establishes, it is difficult to control with anything. And when we get to that stage for the post-emergence treatments, Olympus uh, has provided the best activity, uh, can kill some of the plants, but uh, more there, we're just trying to prevent production for the following season. And other products tend to be a little bit weaker on it. PowerFlex, I haven't had enough experience to know whether it controls well or not. Prickly lettuce would be one of the broadleaf winter annuals. Of course, it looks like dandelion. If you turn the leaf over and you have the long row of, of spiny growths off the midrib. The prickly lettuce is a composite species. It is controlled very effectively by, by many of the growth regulators, but especially Pyrrolyte type products such as Curtail, Curtail M, or Wide Match. Horseweed, I see my Z fell down below as we moved from one system to the other. But horseweed is becoming a larger issue in North Dakota because of resistance that has developed <clears throat> to glyphosate. We have confirmed that in Cass County. There are other areas of Lemoore and Pierce and McIntosh where samples have come in where we suspect there could be some resistance but they haven't been tested yet. With the without use of glyphosate really by on controlling young rosettes, plant growth regulators and ALS inhibitors at those early growth stages tend to be fairly effective. <coughs> Field pennycress. We get into the on the mustard side of things, recognized by the penny shaped seed pods <clears throat> that can close the seeds. It takes off very early in the spring, and ALS inhibitors are very effective even once this plant starts to fold. Now, there are a couple of other in the mustard family of tans of mustard and flicks wheat and very finely divided leaves, and they're also control at the early rosette stages is important for control so that it does not extend to the stage flowers are being produced. You may still be able to get control with ALS inhibitors, especially with combination of a phenoxy-type herbicide, but control definitely starts to get more limited. Comparing this with a perennial, this is false chamomile. False chamomile, once it is established as a perennial, again, very difficult to control. Combinations of ALS products plus a phenoxy have done quite well, but a lot of the herbicides used in cereals that are based on contact type products will not be very effective on this wheat. There we see false chamomile. Once it starts to flower, you get that typical daisy flower head on it. The other thing that I wanted to talk about for a little bit was the kosher monitoring. We have several fields that people sent in samples last year. This was initiated because we had two specific sites, one up in Pierce County and one in the corner of Stutzman County, that glyphosate resistance was suspected in 2011. 
through greenhouse testing, we did find that both of these locations had a very elevated level of resistance where even a gallon, more than a gallon of power max was not controlling all of the plants. And compared with that with 11 ounces that would control every plant in the susceptible check, definitely indicated that we had a problem. The same seed lot was exposed and we treated with Clarity and Starian Ultra, trying to identify some of the other control options that might be available for cereals. And we were not pleased with the response indicating here definite survival and very vigorous growth after full labeled rates of clarity even in corn or the start of the rate, a high use rate, 5.7 fluid ounces was not killing all of the plants. So we had several samples come in from around the state, mostly from the eastern half, as you can see on the map here. We did have a few kosher samples coming in from the far western the I-95 corridor, and these were seeded into pots in the greenhouse. We had a susceptible check in the upper right-hand corner and a resistant check in the lower left-hand corner. We spraying these pots with glyphosate, a typical response, and more than 50% of the populations were controlled easily with that standard rate of power max. The green in the corner there, of course, with the or the resistant check from Pierce County. But we did have several of the flats that had different amounts of regrowth, depending on if it was a 1x or a, essentially a 3x rate. In some of those pots, the control was almost non existent. We also sprayed all of the houses with chloroxapyr, and typical response to chloroxapyr would not be complete plant death. These plants that are very injured, however, can start to recover after a couple of weeks and start to produce growth. This is of serious concern for our late season weed management because those plants that remain down the canopy all season long, once you remove the weed canopy, they can start to produce new shoots and produce several thousand seeds per plant, even after harvest. So on the kosher side of things, what are some of the other options? Well, we do have very effective use of glyphosate or fluoroxapyr still in much of the state. However, we do have fluoroxapyr working as well as it should from essentially every area where we receive samples. So in those areas, cereals, of course, will rely on buckatril with either bromoxamil, any kind of bromoxamil. Copac product seems to be working quite well yet. In other crops where you can use atrazine that has been very effective. PPO inhibitors, the AIM, is very effective in crop if the plants, again, are less than two inches tall. Sharpen can be an effective pre plant burn down at uh, moderate use rates. However, we cannot expect very much soil residual from Sharpen for managing kosher into the season. Essentially, it comes down to making sure that you don't have plants there when your crop is established and trying to manage those emerging plants before they get beyond about three inches in height with, with the suite of products that we have available. I know that a lot of areas that are, that are listening are probably no-till or minimum till, but cold hard steel is still probably the most effective and reliable kosher management tour tool because of the short soil residual of the seed and the susceptibility of the plants to cultivation. I believe that might be the end of my slide set. So if you have any questions, you might be able to answer some on issues or other topics that might be pressing in your mind. <laughs> I see a couple on there that I recognize. Good morning, everybody. It doesn't look like we have many questions coming in. I will be able to stick around 
for a little while. So maybe if you type in questions for me as as Blake is doing some of his discussion, then before I have to leave, I can still maybe answer those. Thanks, Joel, Kurt, and I want to thank NDSU and particularly Scott for uh, helping coordinate uh, the webinar and, and for all the support we've had in, in the promotion of it. Let's see. Oops, I went back up to one, didn't I? You didn't think I did very much. Yeah, you wanted to redo this. <laughs> <laughs> you have to start over. <laughs> Let's see where we get still one more. Let's go back up here. Silence where it's still. Where it's still is. Yeah. Oh, back up. It's got to be right in here. Then. Oh, okay, here we go. Yeah, so you can click on the name. All right, thanks. Let's get started here uh, and try to move uh, rather quickly if, if I can. And uh, what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning is a little bit on nitrogen management and then some on, on disease management, some of the uh, research that we've been doing with NDSU and SDSU and, and ourselves. Uh, if we just look at, at that first slide, you're, you're taking a look at there, the soil test plus the applied end. And this is over trials that BU conducted in in North Central, Northeast South Dakota, and then through the central range of, of North Dakota all the way from Crosby to, to Jamestown to Allendale, kind of on that kind of a line, and probably about 80 to 100 miles either side of it. And what you'll see there is you, you look at the maximum levels were probably coming someplace between 180 and 220 pounds of total available in. Uh, if you look at, at John Lukacs' data from North East North Dakota, You'll see that from 2009 to 2011, since John has started working on winter wheat, you'll see it probably pretty close to that same amount of nitrogen, uh, maybe slightly higher on, on the top end. Uh, the one thing that was, was kind of interesting, and when we added the 2012 data into the DU sites, uh, we added another five locations, and you'll note that that bottom line has, has shifted a little bit to the left to a little bit less nitrogen. And uh, the reason for that, we believe, is, is if you remember the winter was open, uh, we were warm most of the winter, and then March was about 15 degrees of normal. And we think there was probably a, a quite a bit of extra conversion going on in the soils from the organic matter. And uh, so we had actually two sites that responded to N, additional N. We had two sites that, that showed no response to additional N once we got to that per 60 bushel yield goal plane. And then we had one site where Actually, every level of N that we added decreased yield further, and that was due to the fact that the additional N caused lodging. So the, the more N we put on, the more lodging we had, and the lower the yields became uh, with that nitrogen. And we, we knew that to be the case uh, through farm experience and, and past yield experiences, but in the, actually now in the 13 years we've been doing these trials, this is the first year we've been able to document it in a trial setting. Uh, so that, that does happen. So if we look at the amount of nitrogen, uh, talking with Ron Gelderman uh, at South Dakota State, uh, SDSU is still at 2.5 pounds. Uh, NDSU is, is at, still at 2.5 pounds per bushel uh, of actual nitrogen, and uh, they're working on new recs. Uh, some data that we've been using in our DU studies uh, from ARS that was conducted for a, a long period of time with winter wheat at Mandan, uh, North Dakota, and at Sydney, Montana, was, was 2.25 pounds of N per bushel for 12% of protein. We're pretty comfortable with that. We think at some point in time, hopefully with more data, we'll actually be able to reduce that number further. And uh, I think as some of these new breeding programs and techniques come online now, you'll start to see groups uh, focus on, uh, on greater efficiency of the nitrogen as well in these new varieties. One thing I just wanted to point out, I, I showed this slide last year, is that we just need to remember in working with our producers, or if you are a producer, uh, is that winter wheat has a higher yield potential than the spring seeded wheats uh, by 20 to 30 percent. So you need to take that into account uh, when you design your nitrogen programs for the spring or if you've already done it last fall. Uh, the other thing uh, that I remember in that is I think winter wheat probably can get by with that quarter pound less per bushel than, than the spring grains can. Uh, so you do gain some efficiencies there, but probably not enough to make up the fact that you need to add more into your winter wheat to attain those yields. Uh, 
one thing is, is we talked about the maximum man needed for, for maximum yield to be in that 180 to 220, 230 range. And obviously, economics uh, play an impact on that and what that final end rate will actually be. And you can see on this slide, I'm going to see if I can make this pointer work. Uh, but over on the left side, you've got four and, and six dollar wheat, so you've got two sets of lines. Obviously, you've got higher priced wheat. You can afford to put more nitrogen on uh, on the crop. Uh, the other thing that you've got is, is if you look on the, the far right, you've got 50 cent in, which is the blue lines, and the 75 cent, in, which is the green lines with the six dollar wheat. So the cost of in is going to impact uh, where those, where that line is at. The other issue that you have is the end protein discounts or no pro or and, and no protein discounts. Obviously, if you're you're looking at the point where there's there's no discount on the protein on the top or the blue on the top, we reach our maximum end level at an earlier stage. But if you have discounts, uh, you'll you'll notice then that that you actually need more nitrogen to to reach your uh, top net profit potential for the winter wheat. So you can take a look at this slide more and, and, and as we uh, will post these on our websites at NDSU and, and DU and study these a little bit, but uh, they're, they're kind of interesting. And someday I hope we can, can develop a, a table that will allow us to plug in the discounts, plug in the, the cost of the nitrogen and the, cost and the price of the wheat and, and be able to predict more closely the amount of end that we should probably be looking at on a given year. If we look at placement, uh, Steve pulled together some data for me uh, from our last two years of, of end trials that incorporate timing as well. And you'll note that there's really no difference in yield from the seeding uh, time of application will replace the end below the soil surface to the, the surface applications of 28% with stream bars. And uh, so if you look at it, which would be breaking dormancy, and then we've got the combination of seeding plus, which is a urea down, uh, below the surface at seeding times along with the uh, early stream bar. And then the last one is the seeding with the late stream bar. You can see there's, there's less than a bushel difference in those over the two year period. And this follows a very similar pattern to the numbers that we generated from 04 to through 07 in North and South Dakota in our trial. Well. And if we look at the proteins, uh, this pattern of the last two years in our end trials follows that, that same time span in North and South Dakota when we did 04 to 08, but that, that fall seeding application actually uh, does have a tendency to have a little less protein than, than the spring application, and it generally runs anywhere from three-tenths all the way up to six-tenths less uh, than the spring applications. And I, I think that the graph basically tells you, too, that the more N you put on, the later you put it on, the higher the protein levels will be. Just uh, one site this year where we, we did see response through the full rate of nitrogen rates was at Crosby, North Dakota, and we had fall application versus spring application and then nitrogen rates as well. But if you look at treatments N2, 3, and 4 on the left, those were urea at seeding time placed in a deep band. And then N5, 6, and 7 were stream bars. Uh, N2 was a 60 bushel uh, yield goal rate, 3 was 85, and 4 was 110, and 5, 6, and 7 were corresponding to. One thing you'll note was that there was probably a slightly higher yield to the, the fall application with the urea when you average those three at 91.5 uh, versus the, the uh, stream bar in at 89.5. Statistically, obviously, not a difference. But we were noticing that pretty consistently this year, and we think that was probably due to the fact that we had the urea placed below ground. We, we did not have we did have excess moisture, obviously, following seeding and, and during the course of this growing season. And where we looked at the UAN, sometimes the rainfall didn't come following the UAN application for anywhere from two to four weeks following the UAN application. So there was some delay in, in the availability of the, the UAN. And if you look at the proteins uh, on the right-hand side, you'll note that with the inching fertilizer rates within the N234 and then within the N567, you'll see increasing uh, levels of protein, which you would expect. The other thing, again, just showing the protein on the right, the average of 11.6% for the urea in the fall versus the 12.2% for the UAN in the spring, just pointing out the fact that some spring nitrogen has a, the ability to increase your protein levels for you. 
been looking at at our watery stage nitrogen application, in other words, uh, applying 10 gallons of 28% with 10 gallons of water for a total of 20 gallon breaker with a, with a flat fan nozzle, uh, trying to increase your proteins right after flower, but before the kernel leaves that watery stage and, and hasn't re reached the milk stage. Uh, but if you look at the yields of, uh, of the, uh, let me get the pointer here, uh, comparing the, the watery stage in versus the no watery stage and you can see that the yields were identical. Uh, in some cases, uh, depending on how the applications go, some people do worry about uh, the watery stage application reducing yields due to leaf burn, but we did not have any issue with that the last two years. If you look at the, at the probe levels uh, on the right side, you'll note that uh, for the 60 bushel yield goal, when you increase those nitrogen levels for the 85 bushel, we increased the amount of protein from 12.1 to 13.1. And uh, you can see that, that similar trend under the no watery stage uh, nitrogen applications, or excuse me, with no uh, actual application at the watery stage, you can see that the increased levels of animals increase the protein. Uh, but I think the important thing here is if, if you look at the, the yellow shaded area uh, in the bottom, the watery stage application gave us 12.8% protein versus none at 117 for the average. So we picked almost a full point of protein up this year from that application. Last year, those numbers were at about a half percent. So we look at some, some information that Ron Gelderman shared with us in December, and, and I want to thank Ron for these. Ron had done some trials with ESN on urea and its influence on, on winter wheat yield. The thing that, that I want to point out is you'll notice these are two locations, Fort Pier and Wall. And you can see there were some tremendous yields at, at Pier, and 102 in, with the fall application of urea, and 107 with the spring application of urea. The thing that you'll notice, though, is he added the ESN. They were both 102, and with that spring application, he lost about five bushels. And you'll see that he lost eight bushels with the spring application uh, at Wall. And my guess is is that this was 100% uh, ESN treated urea that. Uh, ESN met urea to a point where it didn't benefit yield. And then you'll notice in, in the next slide that you'll see that the, the protein levels actually increased a little bit, and that would probably fit that reasoning then, is that the ESN held that, that nitrogen. So if you're going to use ESN with your winter wheat uh, application, just remember winter wheat needs that nitrogen early. You're probably definitely not going to want to put 100% urea uh, spread out there in the spring of the year on, on your winter wheat. We look at this, this next slide, looking at agritain. This was some work that John Bukach has done uh, up in northeast North Dakota. He actually had six sites in, in 2010 and 2011, and I, I dropped the one site. I was a little uncomfortable with with the ray. The, the urea agritain was, had, had dropped its yield pretty substantially, and I think it's one of those outlier type situations. Uh, but at any rate, you can, you can take a look at the yields at the various locations for 10 and 11. And you'll note in, in several cases, there's no difference in yield. Uh, but in two or three cases, there are some, some differences in yield. And if you look at the averages on the far right, you can see the urea was, was basically 80 bushels. The urea plus agritain was 83.8 or about 84. And then the ammonium nitrate, uh, which is not to have any volatility because it's 100% it's nitrate, had 83.3. So it's kind of a check to, to the agritain. Um, so John says it's, it's not meant to work every year because you hope you're going to get rain with that urea on the surface and it's going to take it in, and, and I agree with John. So it's in those circumstances where maybe like in 2012, we applied the urea early. We had an early spring. We didn't get any rainfall for two to four weeks. Uh, so you would hope expect to see a, a response. I know on some of the trials that we did in 2012, we did not see a response. Uh, to the agritain, and again, I think it went back to the fact that we were getting some version of organic matter, uh, that we, uh, it wasn't an issue. But I think this is probably the most important thing I'm going to show uh, in my portion of the slides today. Joel talked about stands and, and stage of winter wheat. And if you look at the, the top left-hand picture, uh, you'll notice that the development here is, is from below the soil surface all the way up to one leaf stage. And this was actually in the fall of 2011 at our Minot location at Winfield. And then if you look at the bottom slide on, on the right, this was actually a little fallow strip, uh, a plot area that, that hadn't been 
uh, seeded the prior year. We seeded right through those areas. You can see we had two and a half wheat wheat there uh, versus the stage that we had. One of the things that we tell growers is our goal is, is to have approximately uh, 50 to 70 inches per square foot when we come to that harvest stage. Now, obviously, if, if we're seeding and we're seeding at rates of 25 to 35 plants per square foot, we're going to need to make up some time here, and so we're going to need to want to encourage some tilling. And so we're going to want to probably put some nitrogen on early uh, to enhance that, uh, the tillery prospect. So if you look at the, the two pictures in the two corners, we got good vigor in the field on the left, but we got very poor vigor on the field on the right. And uh, what you want to do is just as soon as you can traffic that field once the frost is out, is probably to get 15 to 25 pounds of N on in some form, with urea or 28% or, or whatever form you can get it on, and hopefully get some rain and help stimulate the tillery. Just looking, I'm going to cover now just a little bit on, on disease management, and mainly it's on, on fungicide timing applications and, and on response. In 2012, we saw the least response we've seen in the past three to four, or possibly five years, uh, to fungicide applications. As you recall, it was dry early, so tan spot wasn't a big issue, and scab was not a big issue. We did have some stripe rust in some locations in eastern Dakota. Uh, but you can see that in our 2012 variety trials, which are scattered across North and South Dakota, we had a 3.8 bushel response across all varieties. And that obviously varied from location to location and from variety to variety, with about a 5% return uh, increase in yield, I should say. We looked at 2009, it was a, a 10.2 bushel response and about a 15% increase in yield. Uh, 2010 was a 14.2 bushel with about a 20% response. And 2011 was a 12.9 or 13 bushel with about a 24% increase. And, and so we will look at that average across all those years with 12 included. Uh, it's been about a 10 bushel response with about a 15% increase in yield. John gave some data. I'm not going to go through this slide, but I just wanted to show it to you. And you can go back to, again to the websites and, and dig into this if you want. But this is John's data from Northeast North Dakota from 9, 10, 11, and 12. And from that data, these next three or four slides uh, are summarized from that data. But if you look at, at the sites, there was 22 experiments that contained the Pissarro application at early flower in the studio with the herbicide and then the Pissarro at, at the early flower and then the check. And you can see that in, in those years in northeast North Dakota, uh, he's getting most of his benefit from the Pissarro application at the early flower. So in three out of 22 experiment, experiments, as indicated below, he had a five bushel or greater yield increase attributed to herbicide timing uh, with the fungicide. So if you look at the next one, he, he broke that further apart, and it, he's indicating that in five out of 14 experiments, uh, there was a five bushel or greater yield increase due to the flag leaf fungicide. And then in 12 out of 14 experiments, it was due to the early flower fungicide. So for John in that area, uh, that is a, a pretty strong evidence that that application at that early flower stage is really important. And then he went on to further break out a few other comparisons and in indicating that in four out of ten experiments, Pissarro treatments yielded five bushels or more than the Polypure treatments. I think many of you probably remember Marsh McMullen, the NDSU plant pathologist that retired last year, always indicating that she felt that the Pissarro paid uh, for the difference in cost between that and the full cures and the generics. And John's data here is, is indicating the same. Uh, if you look at the next statement, in seven out of ten years, full of cure increased yield by five bushels or greater over the no fungicide treatment. And in the case of Pissarro, it was eight out of ten experiments in that particular series. I think if, if you look further south, say south of Highway 2 and west of Highway, uh, there you'll see those early herbicide treatments or the combination of the herbicide and fungicide pay more than they do in John's area because tan spot is a bigger issue as you move into to a different climate compared to what John has up in the north, east corner of North Dakota. Uh, just uh, in closing, uh, to open it up for questions, uh, we're thinking about conducting a webinar in July or August again uh, to talk about a number of different things, but to prepare for seeding in the fall. Uh, some of the stuff we'd like to probably share then is we're getting quite a bit of new data with this, with started re trial research with P and potassium chloride and sulfur, and so we're going to share some of that. 
I also want to share some information on some of the no-till rotations that are going on around, around the country. This is just a slide from the CCSP farm that is kind of jointly led between growers in northeast South Dakota and southeast North Dakota. And what you have there is a blue lines is the yield for corn in a corn-corn rotation where the corn is strip-tilled. Uh, the second bar, the rose-colored bar, is, is a wheat wheat, a spring wheat, winter wheat, and then corn following that. And in a strict no-till setting, till. And then this, the third one, the yellow bar, is, is a spring wheat, winter wheat, uh, and then corn. But the, uh, the winter wheat is strip-tilled in the fall, and then the corn is planted into that. And then it's a soybean corn rotation uh, where the uh, soybean ground is strip-tilled and the corn is planted into that. And you'll just notice the four-year average. I did not include 2011 because of hail. Uh, but you'll note that, that the, uh, the strip heat and the soybean strip till are both very competitive one another over the long term. And you'll note that the corn on corn, even using the strip till, uh, cannot compete uh, with those two. And then the other thing you should point out is actually in 12 and, and 08, you'll note that the corn has done a little better in one year. And then that the, the no-till wheat without the strip till has actually done the best. And that's when we're in a drier environment and warmer environment in those two. And I think the one thing we should remember is we've been in quite a period of wet years, and I'm just kind of wondering if we're not transitioning back to a drier climate, and if we do uh, some of the things and some of the practices that we look at, we may need to go back and evaluate where we're at prior to this wet period. And so those are some of the things we'd like to probably take a look at in the next webinar, some of the rotation impacts on economics and some of the things uh, dealing with rotations on weed resistance. I'm going to quit with that, and we're going to open it up to questions. Well, we're waiting for some questions. Again, I'll just remind you that uh, we'll be uh, posting these to the websites, and if the South Dakota State folks like us to ship it to them and have them posted on their website, we can do that as well. Because a number of the pieces of data that, that we used in our trial things are from South Dakota. Um, the other thing, what well, we did also indicate that we were going to give out a little prize, and uh, Joel picked out a number for us. And uh, then Scott figured out who, who the login was, and that was Sue Raisland. And I believe Sue is a writer for the Farm and Ranch Guide in Bismarck, so Sue will be getting you that uh, little gift later on. And to uh, any person who talked about the Farm and Ranch Guide, I mentioned it in my group. Okay. I, I see there's a, a comment there about that there's less than 10% of the winter wheat in our area has emerged. What are the hopes for a decent crop? Uh, we can, Joel and I will both respond. Yeah, that, that really is a, a point of concern um, because we really don't know what the status of that seed is. I mean, it, it's quite possible that it uh, imbibed and started the germination process, and that process will continue as we get into the spring. And uh, that seed will obviously have burned, so that's not a critical issue. It's just kind of how much vigor and how much stand we're going to likely get from a, a crop that really just started the process of germination in the fall. So that would be one scenario. I guess we could have a scenario where those seeds sit there dry and never did germinate. They'll germinate in the spring, and uh, and then, you know, I guess in a worst-case scenario, they'll they'll act like a winter wheat crop that was planted in the spring and will not have been fertilized. But my my sense would be that in most locations we probably had enough uh, moisture to get this germination uh, process started and that we'll have to keep a close eye on the fields as we come into spring and to see if they're survived. Because, you know, that's one strike against them being lady mergers um, or in small plants in the fall. And um, and uh, hopefully that they'll will have the kind of weather that will allow those things to express themselves and get out of the ground before it gets too late in the season to where we have to make some kind of determination where we terminate the crop and plant something. Else. But uh, I think generally we would say that that it's not a hopeless situation. That uh, that. Uh, Often we have success when the fields uh, that were planted in the fall really didn't emerge completely in the fall, uh, but we were able to get a start and, and then develop into the spring. Uh, just 
Tom and I've been working with Winter Wheat since 1977, and you know, it seems like one location every year, either with research or with my actual fields and one of my farms as well, is that we would have a location someplace where winter wheat either was underneath the soil surface or slightly above the soil surface. Um, but so much of the weather it makes it in Mott depends on obviously over winter, but this period we're in right now, if we can get some moisture to regret that surface, if the crown is still alive anyway, uh, there's still a very good chance that this crop will make it. Uh, I think we've only lost one research plot since 1999 uh, due to poor emergence, um, and we've had a, quite a few of them that were either below the soil surface or half a leaf to a leaf stage of growth. Uh, so don't be completely discouraged by it. I guess the other thing I'd encourage you to, to consider is the fact that if you're dry and you take this crop out, what crop are you going to plant and what crop is that crop going to have any better chance of making it? So. I, I'd encourage you, particularly in those areas where you don't have any subsoil moisture, to, to give this crop a little bit of time before you get too anxious. Okay, the mold. Okay, I just want to one comment. If if you're seeing mold uh, on the plants, it's probably it. Uh, so that is generally a pretty good sign that that plant has succumbed. What was the next question? Uh, yeah, Joel says 32 degrees. So, and, and I agree with that. As far as vernalization, uh, I'm not worried about vernalization at all. If you've had that seed in the ground. Uh, my guess says is there's been enough moisture went for that seed to swell, and that uh, that's all it takes. Then once then it gets cold again, then the fertilization process is is, is taken quite care of. Interesting responded to when you were talking before there. Okay. Yeah, and that's okay. that'd be the next question. I think. Seed fertilizing. As far as how long is the temperature required to to be cold again, Joel, I can't remember what the time period is. You, you know, it, it's probably about a 30-day period. Yeah. Joel is saying it's about a 30-day period that you need uh, for that cold. Uh, one of the things that you can do is if you go to our website or the DU Canada website or the Saskatchewan, there's a – Dr. Fowler has one of cereals manual there, and there's a really good section on – uh, cold and vernalization, and I would guess that NDSU and SDSU probably have that in their materials as well someplace. And just bear in mind, it doesn't have to be crazy vernalized. Yeah, and Joel pointed out, and, and that's true, that it doesn't have to be below freezing for the vernalization to occur. It's, it's just temperature below a certain level. To a listserv, and then Becky actually answered that. Aaron answered. Okay. So then Evan just popped it in. Okay. Next question from Evan is: that when we planted into broken CRP, and am most concerned with the volunteer grass, mostly Timothy. What herbicides would you recommend, Joel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think unless it's one of those winter annuals, generally the normal, you know, grass weed control will take out most of the grass. You just want to get good timing on the case where you have it start. Uh, Joel's, Joel's response is, you know, if it's, it's your annual, your winter annuals or your, your annual grasses, you know, we've got some tools to select from. But if a perennial, which I think Timothy is, and I'm not familiar with, with control on, on Timothy, uh, but my guess is, is, is you probably don't have uh, much choice in terms of that control. But I tell you what, if you want to go to our website and drop me an email, Evan, uh, I'll do some research on that and, and try to get back to you. Okay, we think we may have missed a question here. I'll get to the ice question here in a couple seconds. I can't remember that was. Is that the person you went to? 
Yep. You did. One above that. Okay. No, nope, that was the first one. And then there's the. Okay, where are we at? So ice. Ice. Okay. Yeah. Ice can have a very detrimental effect on winter, uh, particularly uh, as we we get closer to uh, breaking dormancy, as that plant is is needing more oxygen. But uh, if you get get a layer of solid ice over top of that plant and it stays there for probably four to seven days, uh, it can actually uh, cause desiccation. Uh, and, and the most, uh, the worst situation with bees at surfaces is uh, probably a little dry and you get some melting going on and then you get a solid layer of, of water around that crown and all the way to the surface of the soil. And uh, that, that get, becomes probably the most detrimental. Yeah, so it's it's not what you'd call typical winter kill. This would be ice encasement. It's very deadly. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, it it'll, it doesn't take long to kill the plant. But it's common, except in your low spots, typically, that you would have your whole field covered with ice. But it's, yeah, it's any time from now until uh, things get too big to be iced up, uh, ice encasement can be a real uh, lethal kind of scenario. One of, the, one of the things we've experienced is, is that if the ground is warm underneath the ice layer, uh, that ice can actually, well, actually granulize, particularly if you've got a snow layer above the ice. And uh, sometimes it, it will granulize fast enough that, that there'll still be enough oxygen movement. Or if you've got stubble sticking through that ice, uh, that can also act as a conduit for oxygen as well, and that can help. Well, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, unless we have a quick question. Well, thank you, folks, for attending. Uh, looks like we had uh, pretty close to 70 folks on, and I think there were some groups and sessions. So if you uh, find us an effective way to communicate uh, some timely issues, uh, let us know. And we'd also appreciate feedback on the type of information you'd like to see in these webinars. So thanks again for your participation. Thank you very much.